have to forgive me, dear ones, but I always have to take a sniff of fresh flowers. These are a week old, but they smell good. It's good to the soul. It helps us to really see the benefits of what God has done for us. Yes, in many ways. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's be in the spirit of prayer. Heavenly, most gracious, merciful Heavenly Father, the Holy One who redeemed us, we're so grateful for our redemption. There was a time in this life when we were strangers to you, but now we're known as people of faith your chosen ones who listened to the scriptures, followed your word. Because once upon a time, we were all strangers to one another, but now we find the family of God. And we're all together now as brothers and sisters. We're grateful for that, Lord. We're grateful for this lectureship that's been so impressive to our hearts, impressive to our minds, and especially impressive deep within our souls. May you always be with us and grant us the compassion that you had for mankind when you walked the earth. Now, dear Lord, we ask your blessing upon this afternoon messages that we would take it in solemn hope, in prayer, deep desire to not only know the Bible, but to live the Bible, that we would apply it. For it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you, uh, you may not know, but I'm, I'm sure you know who Richard is and you know who Clint is, and, and I'm Jared. I'm the, I'm the third minister that, that's here on staff, and I, I have the distinct privilege of working with uh, our teens and their families. And I don't know how long ago it was when Richard stepped in my office and, and he said, what, what do we want to do with the teens at the lectureship? And I said, well, I, and you can look at, at Brett's titles and you'll figure out pretty quickly what the teens are going to be focusing on. I said, this is what we need to focus on. Okay, well, who do you want to come and speak? I thought about it for a moment. I said, I think we need Brett Petrillo. And I just butchered his name, Brett Petrillo. And, and Richard said, well, have you ever met the guy? No, don't even know what he looks like. I have no clue who he is. But I know, I know him by reputation. And I think he will do an excellent job uh, with, with our teens. And I know he will. 
And then, and then Richard's, you know, he's like, okay, let's, let's go with that. And, and then he showed me a picture of Brett, and I was like, I'm really going to like this guy. <laughs> we have the same haircut. And so Brett Petrillo is the youth minister at the Bear Valley Church of Christ and has been there for the last 13 years. He's also an instructor for the Bear Valley Bible Institute, and he's done that the last four years. He studied youth and family ministry at Harding University before transferring and graduating from the Bear Valley Bible Institute, uh, and he's got a couple of degrees from there. He has di directed the Bear Valley's Future Preachers Training Camp since 2017, and he and his beautiful wife, Julie, are blessed with four wonderful children, Ashlyn, Easton, Breland, and Kyson. I got it right, didn't I? Yes. Brett, come on up and preach to us. Good afternoon. I can't tell you how uh, amazed we are with your hospitality and kindness. You don't know me, I don't know you, but I feel like family. Thank you for uh, the love that you've poured out to us. This is a special place. I understand what Corey was talking about when he talks about this is his favorite lectureship. Don't tell my dad, but it might be my favorite lectureship too. <laughs> I do have a question though. Have you seen the front flyer? I was noticing a distinct similarity among the speakers, at least most of the speakers, and that is at least four of us are very good looking. <laughs> Corey has a lot of work. We can work on that later on. Hiawatha, a little bit less, but you know, that's okay. So uh, privileged to be here. Thank you so much for the invite. So glad to have my wife uh, here with me. If you're not sure who she is, just look for the most beautiful woman in the room and you will see her. His name is Carlo and he made his way to the United States back in the early 1900s. He only had about $2.50 to his name, but he was really tapped into the American dream. He wanted to come and make a name for himself. He wanted to start a business and he wanted to be able uh, to tap into those riches and the freedom that you could find in this country. And so when he got off of the ship and he made his way into New York City, it took him a little bit of time to try to kind of find his way, find his niche. What could he be good at in this land of freedom? And he went through several different uh, avenues for about 17 years and just kind of struck out. It just wasn't working. And then in January of 1920, he had an idea. He found out that if you go and you buy a bunch of stamps in foreign countries, when you bring them to the United States, the United States will pay more for them with inflation and different uh, money exchange rates and things like that. And he thought... This might be a good opportunity for me to make some money. But then he thought, what if I get a lot of other people to invest a lot of money in this, and then, using my financial wizardry, what I can do is I can really turn this into a great profit. And so he began promoting this, uh, this idea among other people. He claimed to have these networks of, of uh, workers in foreign countries just waiting for somebody to send them money so that they could buy all of these stamps. He would work his financial magic, and then they would turn a great profit. He was saying that he could, in just 90 days, have an, uh, a, turn their money with a 50% profit. 90 days. So people said, I want some of that. Just a few months later, and seven, uh, just seven months later, the Boston Post promoted uh, Carlo's idea and talked about how he was turning people into from rags to riches. And so people were saying, man, I want to get in on this. And so as he was arriving into his office that morning, uh, it, the line was all the way down the stairs. It went all the way uh, out the building and around the corner. People were just itching to hand them their money so that he could go and invest it into this scheme. You couple that with kind of his charming uh, demeanor, his charisma, and it was just the perfect scenario for him to take their money. 
About 40,000 people got involved in Carlo's business until it was found out that the entire thing was a fraud. What he was doing is he was taking uh, the money from the most recent investors and he was paying ones previously. So you give me a lot of money, I'll go pay someone that's been waiting on money. There is no actual scheme. He didn't have any people in foreign countries. There's nothing like that going on. The whole thing is a big fraud. And this eventually was going to catch up to him and was going to land him in quite a lot of jail time. And he ended up uh, pondering off millions of dollars from people. You know, you may not know the name Carlos, but I bet you know him by his full name, Charles Ponzi. This is the man that became infamous for what we now dub as the Ponzi scheme, with multi-level marketing schemes and those types of things. What we find in Carlo is a person who is the definition of inauthentic. When we're talking about the idea of restoring the fire, nothing uh, douses the flames within us quicker than being inauthentic. If you want to really uh, to quench the flame inside, then be something, claim to be something, but then be something else. The definition of authenticity or being authentic is being what, it, or, uh, being what it's claimed to be. Church, who do we claim to be? We claim to be Christians. And so, if I claim the name of Christ, if I claim to be a Christian, but behind the scenes I'm not, is that not going to put out the flame within us? Because I think at the, when we really get honest with ourselves and we look at ourselves, we go, I know I'm not authentic. I know that I'm not really being who I'm supposed to be or doing what I'm supposed to do. And so why then would we show such a great passion? Why would we do so great feats for the Lord when deep down we know there's some stuff going on behind the scenes? And it ends up dousing the flame, lowering the flame. In order to restore the flame, church, we're going to have to do a hard examination this afternoon. We're going to have to look at our lives and we're going to have to ask some real questions. Because in a crowd this size and maybe other people who'd be watching later, the chances are extremely high that as we sit in the pew, we know deep down that maybe there's some things going on, that the flame is not quite as bright, or perhaps even it's out. And so how do we bring it back? David, of course, uh, King David was a man who did incredible things for the Lord, but he was not a perfect man. And the text that I've been assigned is Psalm 51, where it's talking about what happened after his sin with Bathsheba. But in order to do that, we need to really kind of get a running start and figure out what exactly happened there before we get into Psalm 51. And so when we examine the scenario, it kind of transpired like this. Back in 2 Samuel chapter 11, what was occurring was all of the kings were out to war, except for David, for whatever reason, he was not out to war. He was back in his palace in his comfort and luxury. And while they were out for battle, uh, he's back at the palace and he walks out in the cool of the evening, just enjoying uh, whatever uh, scenery was before him as far as sunset or whatever. And he notices that there is a woman bathing. He has a choice. He could have said, well, nope, and turned away. But the first mistake was that he allowed lust to take place. Where he looked with desire upon Bathsheba. And from there, he decided that he wanted to pursue these uh, thoughts that were coming up within him. And it resulted in adultery where not only was there adultery, but she became pregnant. And now he's got a problem. 
Because he shouldn't have done this. He shouldn't have been in this position to begin with. He shouldn't have lusted. He shouldn't have committed adultery. But now he has. And now he's got to try to cover the whole thing up. And so he thinks, well, okay. Uh, I'm going to go uh, send message out for her husband, right? I'm going to bring Uriah back here. And I'm going to try to deceive him into uh, going and, um, and being with his wife. And then... The whole thing will be covered up. Nobody will know, right? And so that's what he does. He calls Uriah back and uh, goes through the whole process and, and talks with him and says, you know, go home. Thank you for all of your service out in the battle. And he goes, no, I can't go home. He said, I got brothers out at war. Who am I to come back and, and uh, kind of relax for a while? So he didn't go home. So David thought, well, maybe if I get him drunk. Then he won't be thinking clearly, and then he'll go home. Tried it, still didn't go home. So he thought, well, now I'm really in trouble. I guess I'm just going to have to kill him. So he sends Uriah with his own death certificate, right? Sends him with the note. He brings it back out to the, to the battle, and the, the uh, procedure was for the army to charge in, right? And then as they you know, put Uriah right on the front line, and as they're charging into the battle, everybody pull back just a little bit. So he gets struck down, and then it's like, well, it happened in battle, whoops. And what's interesting is if you continue reading on with the account, it didn't work. Because the battle actually moved all the way to the gates, and that's eventually where Uriah was killed. No matter, it was still resulted in his death because of uh, David's command. Shouldn't have been there to begin with. And so, all of this is transpiring, all because of what happened on the rooftop. Think about that for just a minute. Man, David has come a long way from the giant killer. What happened? Can you see that the flame had grown dim? How does a person get to this point? To where they are such a, a giant in uh, their dedication and service to God to get to the point to where it's as if God is not even present and selfishness prevails. It's as if the fire had gone out. And so thankfully, God sends the prophet Nathan to tell him a story. Nathan comes up and he describes that there was a rich man who had lots of flocks and herds right, lots of lambs, but there was this poor man who had just one lamb, and he loved that lamb, cherished that lamb, and then the rich man had somebody that came from out of town, and he could have taken from his flocks and herds and, and prepared the meal, but he goes, mm, no, I want that lamb. So he goes and gets the poor man's lamb and slaughters it and prepares a meal for him. And when Nathan tells him this story, uh, David responds, as the Lord lives, surely the man who has done this deserves to die. Hook, line, and sinker. Nathan says, you are the man. That's you, David. Hmm. You can almost get uncomfortable for David. Just sitting there and letting that, those words sink in as he considers the weight of his decisions, his sin, thinking he's got people deceived, nobody knows. Oh, yes, they do. There's no hiding. And so now he has a choice, David does. What do you do? You're caught red-handed. There's no hiding. There's no uh, shifting the blame, right? Right? So what does an authentic person do when faced with a situation like David is in? He basically says, I have sinned against the Lord. He admits it. It's this scene that's going to cause us to walk into Psalm 51. 
that really opens us up into David's heart and lets us see what was going on in his life, what was he thinking, and what does a person who's truly trying to be authentic, who's trying to restore the fire in the soul, do when, cut, when faced with a situation like this? Please turn, if, if you haven't already, to Psalm 51. I imagine you have this memorized. And so what I'd like to do is I'd like to read through it, and that way we can uh, break down the text a little easier now that it will become familiar for us. I'll have it up here on the screen as well. Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness. According to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, I have sinned, and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak, and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in, iniqu in, in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the innermost being, and in the hidden parts you will make me no wisdom." Purify me with hyssop, and I shall, be, I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a, sped, a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will be converted to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, the God of my salvation. Then my tongue will joyfully sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips that my mouth may declare your praise. For you do not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. You're, for you are not pleased with burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken spirit and a contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. By your good favor, do good to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in righteous sacrifices and burnt offerings, and, uh, and whole burnt offerings. Then young bulls will be offered on your altar. Kind of gives you chills to read it. Because this situation is one of the most raw, open, totally vulnerable situations. Again, he's not hiding from it. And so what does he do? I think there's such an incredible lesson to be gleaned from this. And it's, I think we, we're uncomfortable a lot of times with this psalm. And maybe the reason that we're sometimes uncomfortable with the psalm is because it hits pretty close to home. No, I'm not saying that we've gone, we've committed adultery, and we've sent people off for murder. But all of us would raise the hand of saying, yeah, I've sinned. We've all messed up. We're all in the same boat. And so we look at what David is going through. It's really relatable. Because I think as we, as we walk through this text, we're going to see, yeah, that's, that's just like me. I have felt that way. Maybe I feel that way now. And that's going to help us renew the flame of passion again. I want to take a look at what it, uh, how we develop that authentic heart in our lives. If we're going to restore the flame, we're going to have to do the heart examination, and we're going to have to figure out what does this look like? What is it going to take in me, and what did David do in order to restore that flame? First of all, as we examine the heart, I want to notice that he takes personal responsibility. An authentic heart, number one, requires responsibility. As you look through this list, it's really interesting 
all of the times that he took personal responsibility within this psalm. And you may have caught it as we read through it. He said, my transgressions, my iniquity, my sin, my transgressions, my sin, I have sinned, I've done evil, I was brought forth in iniquity. Um, he talks about my sins, my iniquities, my blood guiltiness. What other synonym could he have used for I've messed up? It's interesting that he comes about it from all angles, underneath, above. He uses all kinds of different words from sin to iniquity to transgressions to blood guiltiness. He is in no uncertain terms saying, I messed this thing up big time. Not hiding from it. Not trying to skirt around it. I've sinned. You know, what, we as people often try to shift the blame. So we have four kids. And it's always interesting to kind of watch the chain effect of how this works, right? One of them gets in trouble, and what do they do? Oh, no, no, no. It was my sibling. She did it. And then she goes, since we have four, well, no, no, it, he did it. And it goes down the line because we don't like getting in trouble. You've probably heard about what happened with Adam and Eve, where Adam sinned, and God says, what's this you've done? Or he talks to Adam first, excuse me. You know, Adam, what's this you've done? He goes, well, it's the woman you gave me. Eve, what's this you've done? Well, it was the serpent. Serpent? You can almost see him going. And there's no one there for me to blame. We blame people, but not David. He's just owning up to what he did. And if you think about it, what other answers could he have said? Could he have said, I'm the king. I do what I want. You have no right to tell me what to do. I'm, I'm the king. Okay? I get to do what I want. He also could have said, I answer to no man, Nathan. No man I will answer to. He also could have said, well, it's Bathsheba's fault. If she hadn't done, you know, then, no. He could also say, well, I didn't actually kill Uriah, right? I mean, it was the enemy, they, they are the ones that had, you know, they're the ones that took him out. He didn't do any of that. He just said, I have sinned against the Lord. You know, it reminds me of what was going on with Joseph. Back in Genesis when Potiphar's wife made the advance at him. And it talks about how he even left his, his, uh, his cloak in her hand and ran away. But the interesting thing that he said is, how can I do this great evil against the Lord? Certainly there are other parties involved, but ultimately when it comes to sin, it's something between us and God, and that's what really has occurred. And so David is saying, I have sinned against the Lord, and this is a huge problem and completely and totally admits it. If you look at verse 4, against you and you only, I have sinned. And done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak, and blameless when you judge. There's no blame for anybody else, and what it came down to was personal responsibility. Church, step number one, if we're going to be restoring the fire within us, is we're going to have to take some personal responsibility of past decisions. It may be messy, and it may be uncomfortable. But don't we so badly want to have that relationship with God? To have His forgiveness and His mercy? To have salvation? When you think about the blessings that come down from the Lord, feeling uncomfortable for a little while pales in comparison to the blessings to come. But... At one point or another, we're going to have to say, okay, I'm going to stop making excuses for my behavior. I'm going to stop trying to blame other people. I'm not going to blame my siblings. I'm not going to blame my, my spouse anymore. I'm not going to blame my coworkers. In all the other maybe ways that we point the finger and just say, what have I done and what am I going to do to fix it? Number two, we see that an authentic heart requires vulnerability. Did you notice how pained David was by his sin? 
Can you almost hear the tears hit the parchment as he pins this psalm? Can you hear the anguish in his voice as, as the weight of this situation comes down upon him and he realizes what a terrible place he is in? He says, for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Think about that. David's saying, I think about this all the time. If I got any sleep last night, I wake up and this is what I think about. That I messed up. I'm sitting there and I'm eating my breakfast and all I can think about, I can't even taste my food because all I can think about is how I've messed up. I go to lunch, I go to dinner, there's, there's entertainment that's supposed to be brought before me. All I can think is how I've messed up. He says in verse 5, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Sometimes people uh, try to take this and make a theology out of it. What's interesting is in another psalm, he talks about how he's been faithful since his mother's womb. What's happening? What's occurring here with this phrase is he's just saying, I've never been any good. From He's, of course, exaggerating, but he's like, I, there's never been a time when I wasn't sinful. That's how bad he feels. I've always been sinful. I've never made a right decision. This is terrible. I, I'm, so, I'm so messed up inside that it's as if I, as soon as I came out of the womb, I just started sinning. Of course, it's not true. But it's how he feels. It's vulnerable. Vulnerable. It's raw. It's authentic. You can almost hear some of the self-talk that he, he's having with himself. You know what I mean? How could I have ever done that? How, how did I do that? What kind of person does what I just did? Who does that? Can you hear the self-talk? I don't know about you. Have you ever had those self-talks with yourself? Isn't it raw? This is what I'm talking about when it's relatable because if you're anything like me, when we come down to the, the weight of our sin, these are the types of things that we say. He also says in verse 8, Make me to hear joy and gladness. In other words, what he's saying, it's like, wait, are, is he having hearing problems? What's going on here? No, what's occurring is, even if there's entertainment before him, he's not happy. Uh, the servants could be bringing all kinds of entertainment. It could be the most amazing acrobats to ever grace the planet. But to David, there is no joy and there's no gladness. Why? Because all he can think about is his sin. All he can think about is how he's messed up. All he can think about is, how do I get this relationship right with God again? Man, that's authentic. It's raw. It's real. Church, do we struggle with being vulnerable? <laughs> Man, it's hard. Why? Why is it so hard for us to be vulnerable? Well, <laughs> I... I don't want people to know that I'm struggling. Newsflash. You're all struggling. We're all struggling. I'm struggling. We're all struggling. I don't mean, okay, you have a sin that you're dealing with right now. What I'm saying is we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We all. We're all in the same boat. Sometimes we're doing better other times than others. But heaven forbid that we tell each other about these things and use each other for a support, right? Years ago, I blew out my ACL. I was playing basketball, was running, went to stop, pop, there went the ACL. What was interesting is as soon as my ACL ruptured, my body sent adrenaline throughout my body. Okay, natural response to the body, and everything went into slow motion. What's interesting is I'm falling to the ground, okay? And my mind goes, I wonder if I just blew out my ACL. I'm thinking that as I'm falling. 
As I'm falling, my hands naturally came out to brace my fall. Okay? As I reached to the ground, my body turned to the side to try to protect the injured knee. Okay? I was able to use my body to scoot myself in a neutral position. Pain receptors began firing all over my body to let me know that my knee hurts. My knees came down to, to grab the knee. My face grimaced with pain. It's all responding. Okay? The, it naturally began to swell. My eyes began scanning the knee, looking for swelling and, and discoloration. As soon as the play stopped, I, I used my arms and, and my good leg to scoot off of the court. The entire body responded to the injured knee. Sin is just like an injury. How do you get through that by yourself? But it's as if the injured knee wants it nobody else to know that he's injured. And what a detriment. We're crippling each other. How, how much quicker could we get over sin if we were vulnerable and we used each other for strength? What about using that older man or that older woman who's gone through the exact same or very same struggle with you but 20 years ago and came out the other side of it? Do you think that person has anything to offer on how to get past it and to do better? What about the elders of the congregation who can pray for you, who can follow up with you, who can be an accountability to you? We're crippling our effectiveness by choosing to not be vulnerable. But I get it. It's, it's uncomfortable. We don't want to, to tell people our sin, and we're afraid of judgment, and, and heaven forbid any of that should happen, right? But sometimes the front pews remain empty because we have a tough time being vulnerable. Sometimes it takes time for this to occur. That's what happened with David. It took him a minute. But when the weight and the gravity came down upon him, he responded with such an authentic heart. It may be that the fire has been quenched in our souls because what we're trying to do is we're trying to be something that we're not actually. We're claiming to be Christians, but inside we know we're struggling. We know we're dealing with things. And if we're going to restore the fire, the, the fire we're going to have to, we might have to be vulnerable. We're going to have to be authentic. Third, an authentic heart requires humility. It requires humility. David is going to be coming to God with all of his sin. And somebody said this and I felt like it was such an incredible phrase. When a person approaches God with sin, you come to Him as a beggar. When someone approaches God with sin, you come to Him as a beggar. Because what, other, what else can we say? Well, God, you know, I've done a lot of good things, and so this should kind of, you know, equal out now. No. Right? Well, God, you know, uh, I'm gonna, I've really been doing good. N no. We come to him and it's like, I've got nothing. You have everything and I need your help. When you, we go through the psalm here, we see exactly what David is saying. And he begins by saying, be gracious to me, O God. Be gracious to me. And he's going to then, throughout the rest of the psalm, talk about a, a bunch of ways in which he wants God to be gracious to him. As you go down this in verse 2, he says, wash me. It's going to say this both in verse 2 and verse 7. But if you're following along the text, it doesn't just say in verse 2, wash me. It says, wash me thoroughly. <laughs> God, get all the nooks and crannies. Get all of the deep, dark, hard-to-reach spots in my heart. You ever prayed that? Wow. That takes humility to come to God and say, man, I want, 
I want it all to be washed clean. But then he also says to cleanse me. Okay, I'm washed, but man, you ever wash your hands and you just don't feel like they're clean? I felt like that was a lot of the time through COVID. You'd wash your hands and it's like, I need some sanitizer, right? Did you ever go uh, to the store and they had the really stinky sanitizer? I don't know what was going on there, but it was like, well, it's worth it because it sanitizes my hands. It stinks, but cleanse, sanitize, okay? Wash it, scrub it, make it clean. But I also want for you to sanitize this in my life. Then he wants you to purify me. He draws in um, to Exodus chapter 12 from the Mosaic account of, of hyssop and it being sprinkled on the people. He wants him to be, pure, to, uh, to be purified, spiritually clean. Make me hear joy and gladness again. Remember, he's not hearing this anymore. He's not hearing joy and gladness because what's going on is he feels so uh, overcome by the weight of his sin. He wants it clean so he can actually be happy again. Probably my favorite phrase of the entire thing, create in me a clean heart. This word create is the same word that's used in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We can create things, paintings, art. Only God can do this word. And it means take, some, take nothing and make it into something new. What David is communicating here is, God, you can't even restore, you can't even remodel this heart. I need a new one. That's how bad he feels. I need a new heart. Give me a new one. We can't even use this old thing anymore. If it's willing to go to the place that it did, it's no We've got, We need a new one. Restore salvation to me. You think, it's gone. It's gone. I don't have salvation anymore. I'm lost. Restore salvation to me. And it's not my salvation. It's your salvation, God. You're the one who has salvation. I need it. I need this. And then he goes on to say, deliver me from punishment. Uh, back in, in uh, the account with Nathan, Nathan actually said, you're not going to die. According to law, uh, David deserved to die for what he did. Uh, but Nathan said, nope, you're not going to die. But even here in the psalm, he's saying, please deliver me from blood guiltiness. It's almost as if maybe there were whispers behind the scenes where people are going, you know, according to law, David deserves to be put to death for this. And he's going, God, I know you said that I would be delivered from this, but please keep delivering me from this. What incredible humility to ask in no uncertain terms from God uh, to be totally cleansed, pure, washed, totally open, totally vulnerable. Incredible humility that we see. Lastly, an authentic heart requires activity. We can't just sit and do nothing. We see its activity on two sides. We just saw all of the activity from God, where David is saying, I need all of these things. But it also requires activity from you and me. It requires activity from us if we're going to restore the fire and we're going to move forward. He says in verse 12, Restore to me the joy, the joy of your salvation. Sustain me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will be converted to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, the God of my salvation. Then my tongue will joyfully sing of your righteousness, O Lord. Open my lips that my mouth may declare your praise. You may have noticed several actions that are taking place here. Sustain me with a willing spirit. Give me that spirit that wants to go out and do what I'm supposed to do. Like what? Like I'm supposed to tell people when they're wrong because your law says they're wrong. I need to go and I need to convert people to you. That's what I need to do. When I worship you, I should joyfully sing where I, I am praising you and thanking you. And then I'm praising you, and Cliff talked about that, and just walking out, just praising God. Do you ever find moments in our life when it's 
hard to worship? Why? It may be that it's because the flame has gone down because of something we have going on in our life. You know, it's really hard to evangelize when we know we're dealing with problems inside. Why would we do that? Why am I going to try to convert somebody or help them with their sin when I know that I'm messed up and I'm dealing with sin? Why is it that I why would I sit in the pew and just pour out my God and thanks to God in thanks and praise when I know deep down there's stuff going on? Wouldn't it be so nice to just remove all of those barriers, all of those roadblocks, and just with all of your heart, just worship. Praising Him, thanking Him, nothing left back, nothing hiding. Doesn't matter what your voice sounds like because your heart's right. Just praising Him. How easy then is it to talk to people about what's going on in their life? Because we know it's the single most important thing that we can do for another person is to help them get to heaven. We did a heart examination this morning. And one of the thoughts that you may have had when we're going through all that David went, uh, that David was dealing with, is, man, he's really come a long way from a man after God's own heart. I don't know if you thought about that. Is this really a man after God's own heart? And the answer is still yes. Because a man after God's own heart is not a man who's perfect. A man after God's own heart is a person who responds the way that God would want him to in the face of difficulty. When a person, for example, difficulty in going against the giant, how did he respond? Faith. When Saul was trying to take his life, how did he respond? Trusting that God had a plan and he was going to work through it. When he's faced with the sin of Bathsheba, how did he respond? Authentic repentance. He's doing the right thing. That's a man after God's own heart. If we want to restore that flame, we've got to dig deep. We're going to have to look at ourselves. But man, will it be worth it to have that renewed passion and that zeal and that drive for God that maybe has grown cold. It's hard to be on fire for the Lord when our heart is cold. As we move forward, I think the personal challenge is, what are we going to do? Are we going to kind of maybe do what we have done in the past, fall back in the same routines, talk with the same maybe friends or bad influences that we have, or are we going to make a change? Let's take a page from David, and let's be authentic going forward so that we can restore the fire in our souls. Thank you.